Hey everybody and welcome back. You know this is Keith from Two Bits Woodworking. Yeah. And we're kind of ripping one off of the American Craftsman podcast. podcast yeah. Keith bought the beer this time. Yeah, little Schoffenhofer Hefeweizen grapefruit beer. I've never had it, so I'm looking forward to it. Keith also bought me a bottle opener. We've been using the claw of the cam uh, yeah. the claw of the hammer. So this is a nice uh Hopefully it works. It doesn't crack. Worked anymore. really good, actually. So, like I said, we're kind of ripping off the American Craftsman podcast with a new beer. Maybe we should make that a tradition. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll bring the beer next time. Perfect. And uh, it's nice to have a beer at the end of the day. Yeah. No woodworking. We're just talking. Just talking. Yeah. There you go. So, you want to talk about the last projects? So, I have anything you want to... Yeah, the last episode, a couple of people had some comments and some questions, and one of them was, we touched a little bit on how you got started, and, you know, woodworking is an art all on its own, but you also do a lot of painting, so what was your kind of motivation to get into that? Is this something you've always done? Yeah, so the funny thing with the, the painting, I think every young person might kind of wonder, like, when they graduate high school and they're starting their journey through college, what are they going to do? Mm -hmm. And I used to go to New York City by myself. I would just, 17, 18 years old, I would just drive into New York City, find a place to park, and hang out uh, down in the village and go into Soho and look at the different galleries. And I just thought, oh, that looks like a fun thing to do, be a painter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's an easy thing yeah. to do. Yeah. Uh, so just being young and dumb, uh, I started to put a lot of attention into painting. Uh, I was building furniture for clients. I started making some paintings for clients. When my wife and I opened up the gallery in 1999, the, uh, I sold all my paintings and none of my furniture. Okay. And the amount of time that went into painting compared to furniture making was just incredible. Uh, just so much longer to make a piece of furniture and I was selling the artwork for more. So I, we just followed that. And because I can make things, I can make the frames, I can make a structure. I started to do a lot of custom work, which I still do today for designers and architects. And I'm the kind of artist who will just say yes. So a client will ask me, uh, Hey, can you do this or have you done this or what do you think? And I just say, sure. Even if I don't know at the time or if I don't really kind of like the idea that they're talking about, okay. I just keep it positive. And, you know, usually in that drive home from the client's house, wherever the idea kind of comes, starts to form Okay. in the moment. You might be like, well, it seems like a weird idea, but give it a little bit of time. The ideas start to come. And now with, Photoshop, it's really easy to to start to make your ideas easier for your client to see, especially in two-dimensional artwork, right. because the kind of art that I made was more abstract, steel, things like that. You've probably seen the stars that I've made. Right. Yep. And I can make a small one and then make it look as big as I want in the client's home just by digitally installing it there. Okay. So that's, and I still do that and I, I like doing that, but it's great in business to be diverse and be able to sell a painting. And when you sell a painting, that's just like, wow, that's a great deal. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it, but I sold it. And then when you have a piece of furniture you're building for somebody, you've got that going on. And then in this new, bigger, almost bigger portion of the job now is the advertising. And the between the advertising, between the client work, it all can financially make sense. Okay. One other question that we got from the last episode was, you talked about the S4S and using that. And someone wanted to know if we can expand on how to do that, get those fine finished projects without the big bulky machinery, like the big joiner and plane or not having those. And then we know that you can do a lot with the table saw and jigs and... Yeah, like I have a jointer and 
For years, that jointer was in the basement of the house because the, the shop is starting to open up, especially after taking that wall down. Right. But that was like the main thing. This is kind of an interesting thing too. When I started to make videos in here, I realized that this shop was a real mess. And when you are making videos, I think it's important to try to create a space that other people would want to be in. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to my older videos, you'll see it's just chaos in here. And that's because I'm doing too many things at once. Um, but kind of a nice side effect of trying to shoot and have a good backdrop was the, the shop needs to be kept clean. Yeah. So anyway, I didn't have enough space for the joiner. And because I didn't feel like digging it out of storage in the basement, I would either rely on S4S lumber or straight line rip lumber right. or uh, just joining it on the table saw with, you know, sometimes you can screw a little piece of plywood at each end. There's all kinds of ways right. to get around yeah. that. Um, the jointer just happens to be a very convenient way to do it. Quick. Uh, it's quick, it's convenient, and it has, it has other uh, operations. You can use it for tapering legs. Yeah, uh, I've always wanted to do that. I've seen it done. I've seen a lot of people do it on YouTube. It's just not something that I've ever done. What I used to do, like now I've been tapering uh, smaller legs on the table saw. I used to taper the legs on the bandsaw okay. and then run them over the joiner. They were never perfect, but since each leg is sort of, you know, so far away from each other, you don't really, they're within, you know, whatever, Tolerance. 16th <laughs> yeah. of an inch or something. No, Nobody ever notices. But um, anyway, you, because when you're cutting on the bandsaw, it's going to be pretty good, but it might not be perfect. And then you're basically using the jointer to remove those blade marks. And and, right. uh, and I used to do that for years, and I used to use a, a Lee Nelson plane right here. Uh, and I still use that sometimes for that. Uh, i, I got to make a little bit nicer of a tool cabinet here. Um, it's funny, I know a lot of people are really into collecting a lot of different planes. Three or four, two or three actually is really all I need. Right. See, that's pretty much what I use. Um, I'm, I'm in a kind of a paring down mode. What do I really need? Yeah. You know, and uh, because you just end up with with stuff we talked about that last time it's sort of the more stuff you have the less time you have exactly yeah and i mean you have all this extra room now you can just start filling it up yeah no that's the fear <laughs> that is the fear because it, it happens quick it does and i have that space next door and every the reason why the shop looks pretty clean right now is that stuff is just thrown in there it's all out there yeah we'll have to do a shop tour that's coming yeah that people have been clamoring especially now that you've got this yeah. brand new shop can you believe what 90 square feet? It's it's definitely impressive. It's definitely a big change. Then know? the lighting goes up tomorrow. I, um, I'm working with American Green Lights. Okay. They provided the lights and uh, all new LEDs. And my uh, friend Joe is an electrician. He's coming tomorrow and I'll work with him. And we're putting up uh, five on this, five of the 48 watt on this side, five on that side. And I think 224s in the center. Oh, because back there eventually will be, I'd like to get a classic workbench. I mean, yeah. I'm one of the only guys who's probably, I don't, you don't have, but I don't, I don't have the room. The space. Yes, yeah, the space is, yeah, I'd love to do that. And, you know, I've tried to figure out ways that I can kind of incorporate it into a new assembly, outfeed, workbench. You know, you got a one table doing 15 different things. It's, you know, I probably redesigned it like five or six times just trying to figure out what to do. I think just being able to have the density of the top yeah. is a huge thing. Because even trying to chisel on this, this is a piece of three quarter inch with half inch MDF on it. Yeah. And there's so much give that you don't really get a good, you, you don't get a good uh, strike, right. whatever it is. Speaking of projects and furniture projects, you just, uh, we watched, I watched the, uh, the tapered tabletop video the other day and just the way that you got that tapered the step down effect a lot of people actually liked just the look of the step down yeah. effect that was a like a lot of people were like why'd you sand it that was i personally like liked it smoothed off but you know that's like it's so funny when you're working on projects and you you have a vision 
and like halfway through the vision to get to that ultimate place, you, you, you're somewhere and you're thinking, wow, it looks pretty cool. And it's easy to say sometimes or tempting to say, hey, this looks cool. I'm going to leave it. Yeah. But first of all, that in, in my view on that one, I thought that, that was for the client and I didn't think I could pass it off on them. Yeah. And then, and then from a point of, uh, it probably wouldn't look great unless you really sanded it. And that would be a lot of work, like, cause you would still see machine marks Correct. from the router. And so it would look pretty cool, but I think that that would wear off. I think the coolness would probably wear off and more of a dated feel to it. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But it, it was it was kind of neat how that whole thing worked out because from the moment I got that job, thinking about how I was going to do that was one of those, you know, when you're working on a project, the steps in are usually, you're working, whatever you're working on, you're starting to think three steps ahead of what that next thing is. Exactly. And I was always thinking, how is that taper going to work? This is how I think it's going to work, but is it actually going to work? Did you test? Or was the test? Not really. <laughs> no, that was pretty much it. I'm kind of like that. I'm I'm not that patient. Dangerous. I think. That's dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous. Very dangerous. <laughs> this better work. Yeah, this better work, or it's an expensive mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean I was able to set the router, so I at least plunged down, you okay. know, to get an idea before I. I think I just did that by screwing little different holes. Right. So I was able to after I cut that top out. I was able to plunge down to that height, set the depth of the plunger, and then I felt pretty confident. Okay, let's let's go for it. And 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 also I think because it was so much material, I was taking off like only like an eighth of an eighth of an inch or something at a time because I didn't want the router to run or jump on yeah. me. A couple people were saying that would you have been able to do that, accomplish that, maybe by angling the router a little bit too, kind of, almost like a like a router sled, I've seen you know, kind of some people use it almost like a that, little sled. I think that made a lot of sense actually, like putting a, a wedge underneath the router plate. Right. Uh, I literally did kind of think about something like that, but then I just said, I'll, I'm going to put the time in on the sanding because I'm confident that I'm going to get it here. Okay. And it was almost like I didn't want to try to go one step further. But right. when I saw that comment, I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. And I kind of thought about that, but I just didn't want to, I didn't want to venture into some other place. I, my goal was to get that taper. Right. You know, that was the thing. And it's funny because it is so simple, but it, it took a little bit of time to yeah, you figure would, out. Yeah, you would think it'd be kind of, oh, you just got to round it over. Yeah. That's, that's... I've actually done it on a table that I have in my kitchen with a, with a, um, uh, power plane. And the way I would do that is I would just m measure in using a, a handmade compass. Maybe I'd measure in three inches and then just make a dark pencil line all the way around the inside perimeter and then make another pencil line using that sort of pencil line oh, fingernail right. trick. Yeah. So I have a half inch reveal. Okay. And then just and then just saying to myself, okay, don't go beyond that line, especially with the power plane, because that's going to that's going to really chew up some material and kind of rough it all in. There's a, actually a video on YouTube, my cherry tabletop. It's all roughed in with a power plane. Then I think I used that Lee Nelson hand plane. And then I used uh, the orbital sander. But with this table, there was no tolerance for anything that wasn't like perfect because it wasn't for me. I'm trying to make something that doesn't have any, that all the questions are answered. So, we were talking about American Green Lights, and I know you've recently got a couple new sponsors, uh, Acme Tools and Jonathan Green. And both of you, you've kind of been using Jonathan Green for a long, long yeah, time. Yeah, something I'll, new. I, I'll talk about how I like to get sponsors. Yeah, that'd be um, great. Or how I get sponsors. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, for me, if I don't use the product, if I'm not familiar with the product, I don't want to sponsor it because I don't feel I can, I can do it honestly and I feel like it becomes a tremendous amount of work to try to do it. So I have done that in the past where you kind of try to get up to speed on a product, try to understand it, but it's so much work because it's not authentic. 
But if you're using a product and you love this product, then if you get the opportunity to work with them, that's really exciting because now you're using something you love to use. Uh, you already have a great relationship with the product. And the way I want to work with sponsors is I'm telling my friends, hey, this is a good thing because there's great products out there and there's really bad products out there. Yeah. And if you can get somebody to, who might have a little experience with them to just kind of say, oh, this is a good thing. Um, of course, I want my sponsors, I want people to buy my sponsors products. Uh, but um, ultimately, I want them to buy it because they're using it in our project. I don't want to just go out and buy it for no reason. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and that'll happen. There's, I don't work with some companies because there's a real push uh, on products that I don't think are necessary. Okay. And so, because I don't want, I don't want to waste my money. I don't want to waste my time trying to figure out where all this stuff goes. Uh, I won't work with with those specific brands um, because I don't. It's not authentic, right? Okay. Um, this is a funny story. This company, Blockygen, I had a can. I had this can for a year before I worked with them because I'm really? like, what the hell is this stuff? Yeah, you gave me a can, yeah. and I was like, there's, there's no, gave me an empty can. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like there's nothing in here. Right, right. Right? So, the guy, Steven, he is a, I think he's a nuclear engineer, or a rocket scientist. He's something like smart. that. He's a smart dude. Smart guy. Happens to be a really good woodworker. I mean, he's really, really knows his stuff. And the way he came up with this stuff is, uh, I guess his wife would open a bottle of wine and not finish it and want to not have the wine not go bad. Okay. Uh, she would spray some kind of argon gas into the wine and that would keep the oxygen from going into the wine and spoiling the wine. So here he is a woodworker with all his oil based finishes going bad and he thinks, well, why can't that work? So after he explained that to me and then I used it, I was like, holy cow, this stuff really works. Yeah. And the test for me was Zinzer, I think, a uh, cover stain, oil-based okay. cover stain. Yeah. Zinzer oil-based cover stain. If you use like a quarter of the can and then put it away, it's going to skim over in a week. Right. It just skims over and the skim gets thicker and thicker. And I was just used to it and I would end up cutting it out with a knife and then mixing the paint up. The test for me was when I did that Jimi Hendrix painting, right. I used the Zinzer uh, cover stain for the primer and I sprayed that bull oxygen in there six months later I went to use it still liquid that's perfect you know so that was it for me and if you've ever used any kind of oil-based polyurethane or water locks uh, you know that they skim over yeah and so not only are you wasting money but you're wasting space with the can that now is taking up space and you don't know what to do with it because how do you dispose of that? You have to go to the recycling center. Right. And that's bad for the environment. So it had all these things. And I'm, he's, he just sponsors a few things. I hope to work with him more regularly right. um, because it's just a good product. And, I, you know, this is a bull oxygen commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but it is. It's a good product and it's a good guy. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, I think that it, it, it's... It serves a positive purpose if somebody buys that and they need it. If they're a woodworker using oil-based finish, it's going to save them money yeah. and it's going to help them out. And what about like for those those of us who are kind of just starting out? Um, I've been people have contacted me about doing some free product for placement or affiliate links, and I think like for me getting started that might be okay because it's not a like those companies that you're working with, those are those are long term. Sure, you're you know hopefully can have them for a long time. Yeah, like these that I'm thinking about working with, more of a short term, like maybe free product or you know that kind of thing. Well, I would get the product and see if you like it. Yeah. And if you like it, then story about it every time you use it because it's authentic. Yeah. Uh, so. I've got a Bobcat lawnmower. 
I really like my lawnmower. I did a lot of research before I bought it. And uh, if it's appropriate, if I'm cutting the lawn, if, I'm, if it makes sense to say, hey, this is what I'm doing, I'm going to tag Bobcat because I want them to know that I'm a fan of their lawnmower and to somehow get on their radar if they ever want to work with an influencer. Right. The lumber rack, there was a couple questions. Uh, you and I have both dealt with this recently is the cost and the availability of pressure treated lumber. It's like, it's, it's ridiculous. It's hard to find. Know. Somebody left some, com there's a few comments yeah. about that, I think. Yeah. Uh, Keith recently built a lawnmower ramp or ramp into the shed. shed yep. And um, he had the same problem. Uh, I was able to get just enough material for that. I think I was actually planning to build the the platform part out of two by tens originally, which I think would have been overkill. I don't think there's any need for that with the bracing, um, but I don't think they were available anyway. Yeah. And they were expensive. I was like, oh my gosh, this Very is getting, this this rack is getting really expensive. I think that and it was wet. Everything was oh, soaking wet. Super wet. Yeah. A few comments were saying, "Geez, he's driving those screws so deep." But you're not that, trying to. No, it was just because the lumber was so wet. It yeah. just sucking right in there but it, that thing isn't going to go anywhere yeah. once once that wood dries out exactly yeah and i i couldn't find uh two by sixes to do the frame for the the shed ramp yes so i was like all right i'm gonna catch flack but i did it using two by fours because i couldn't find with the three different stores and couldn't find two by six i yeah. did eventually found it so i'm gonna you know when i get it, all my other projects done before the surgery, I'll you're gonna pull up them out. Yeah, I'm gonna pull them off. Put the two by sixes. Oh, is there that much of a sway in it? There's enough. Um, you know, between the seasons, it might get a little bit more flexy. You know, I'm not driving a lawnmower into it. So yeah, yeah. It, it would probably be okay, but it's just I want it to be done right, and I don't want to have to do it again down the road. Well, it's my lawnmower rack is small. Or, Lawnmower ramp is smaller than yours. You've got a larger span, I about believe. Seven feet yeah. long. Yeah. Mine, I think, is like forty-four inches. Okay. But I, I uh, always get a lot of questions on why I filled it with gravel. So I made a frame and I used two by fours, and it's actually sitting on the ground. And then I filled the the uh, frame with three-quarter inch gravel, okay. and I did that to uh, just to keep the groundhogs out. And that shed over there, maybe we'll talk about it when I, we do a um, shop tour. That shed, the whole bottom of that shed had rotted out. I'll try to find some footage. And the reason for that is the water has just fall off. A, it's not a flat roof, but a, a gr very gradual pitch. Okay. And then it would just kind of fall in against the ground and splash up and just rotted the thing out. So uh, the new shed has a two foot overhang and I put a new metal roof on it, a corrugated metal roof. And when I put the siding on, I ran aluminum up the framing, I think 18 inches. And then I ran wire down on the ground or chicken wire or kind of a thinner mesh. I don't know yeah. what you call it, but anyway, so it went under the ground and then I framed out with two by fours that come three feet off of that building and filled that with three quarter inch gravel. Um, I think that's, think that's it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so that's about it for today. Uh, sh shop uh, tour coming up and uh, we'll talk about more projects and I think kind of going into the sponsor thing was cool and I'd be happy to talk Absolutely. more about yeah. that. I know a lot of people have questions, you know, so. Yeah, it's it's one of those things if you can let it happen naturally, that's the best. Uh, and then and then the, the other piece of advice I'll get give on content creating. Uh, so if you're making videos for YouTube and making videos for Instagram, uh, get in the habit of saving or exporting those videos in several different ways before you get rid of it. So, for instance, the the video on the log rack. So that was a sponsor by um, Jonathan Green. So 
I'll save that. That I call that the YouTube video. Okay. Then I'll save the same thing without any sponsor shout outs, without any sponsor overlays, and save that as a version, just without the sponsors. Then I'll save it again without any music. Often I don't use music. I think I did in that one. Yeah. Without any music. Then I'll save it a third time without any music or transitions or voiceovers. Really? Okay. And the reason why I'm doing that is you can take that YouTube video that is, you know, let's six months from now, it'll be six months old. And now you can take that and chop it down to 55 minutes or seconds. And that might be a piece of content that does really well on Instagram. So I know this only from kind of kicking myself in the butt, saying, saying to myself, why do I only have one version of this video yeah, exactly. when I could redo it? Because once you have voiceover and music, to try to fast forward that, because the cool thing about fast forward, and we all know this from Jimmy DeResta's videos, is that subtle sound of the machines happening. Yeah. It kind of, it makes it make sense. You take that same video, you take the audio away, and I think it's missing something. Yeah. So that that's a good habit to get into. Uh, save your save your projects in a couple different ways. It doesn't take that much time, and it doesn't take up much space. Right. And then get in the habit, obviously, of putting everything on an external hard drive. Yeah. Dating it, putting your files in, because you can always go back. Literally, I'll go back three years for a Throwback Thursday or a, okay. a Flashback Friday, yeah. and I'll be like, "Oh, that was a cool video." I'm going to put that up and all of a sudden it gets 80,000 views on Instagram. That's great. And those 80,000 views turn into be four or 500 new followers. Yeah. So it's perfect. A little bit of a uh, little bit of advice, I guess, on, on how you manage your content that you're making. Cause it's a lot of work. You may as well get as much as you can out of it. Agreed. All right, man, this was fun. See you guys next time. Have a good be one. good. That was cool. Yeah.